a problem which, in my opinion, has been clearly and appropriately summarized by this illuminating <coughs> sentence by John Bell. Nobody knows what quantum mechanics say exactly about any situation, for nobody knows where the boundary really is between the quantum system and the world of particular events. Uh, and we have seen today also quantum classical reversible, irreversible, and this kind of thing. So, uh, well, let me just use some picture just for being very, so suppose I have a vertically polarized photon that I sent through a calcite crystal and it goes out from the ordinary ray, so it goes there and it makes nothing. If it is horizontally polarized, it is deflected upward and I have the usual machinery of Schrodinger cat. So essentially from this point of view, the superposition, the um, macro objectification problem is this one. I have projected this only to call attention on the fact that at that level, I can easily check that the superposition is actually there. I, it suffices to put a calcite crystal after that and recombine the two things and to see that you have polar, uh, light polarized at 45 degrees. <laughs> so you can check that. You cannot check the superposition of the live and that cat because of difficulties of practical nature. I mentioned very briefly some of the solutions which have been proposed. In completeness, the state is not everything. This is Bohm, recent, well, and Professor Hailey, and recently Zangi, Duran, Goldstein have worked a lot on this. A limiting observability. Here also we have a long history which goes back to Yauk, even before to Daniri Langer Prosperi. Then we have Jos, Ze, and Zurek, and I don't want to comment about the coherence. Uh, enriching reality is the many world interpretation, all potentially possible macro events occur in different universes. And here I have Everett and DeWitt. Then I have the collapse model. Uh, due to myself, Rimini and Weber, John Bell, and Philip Peer, a unique mathematically precise dynamic at the non-relativistic level, I insist, governs all natural processes. And now I will present the model, uh, the collapse theory. The central idea is that since the Schrodinger evolution is linear and deterministic and the reduction process is non-linear and stochastic, we try to add non-linear and stochastic term to the Schrodinger equation. So we accept to modify the evolution equation. As it is obvious, th there is a problem. If you introduce something which strives to drive the state vector in certain manifold, which manifold would you choose? And then it is obvious that since uh, the situation characterizing macro object correspond to perceptual different locations of some of their macroscopic part, uh, the preferred basis problem is solved in the sense that you have to try to make objective the position of the particle. With these premises, I can be specific about the original collapse model, which, is, uh, which has been published in 1987. Okay, well, the state, the Hilbert space is associated to any physical system, and the state of the system is represented by a normalized vector in the space. For what concerns the evolution, the evolution of the system obeys Schrodinger equation. Moreover, there is this stochastic and random and nonlinear processes. So at random time with the Poissonian distribution, uh, with the Poisson distribution, this does not work, with mean frequency lambda, each particle of any system, you see here I have the n particle suffer a localization, xn at is the position operator of the n particle, x is the position, and so you multiply the wave function times this operator ln. If it suffers a localization, you normalize the vector, and you assume that the probability density for a localization occurring at x is given by the norm of the state that you get when you apply the localizing wave function to the wave function of your system. Uh, in a moment, I will, uh, well, if you want also the ontology, my friend always speak of ontology, in particular Professor Goldstein. So the ontology is that if psi of t is the wave function in configuration space, then you can 
take the modulus square of the wave function, you fix the n particle to the position x, you integrate over all the variable, multiply by the mass of the n particle and sum over the particle. This is assumed to describe the density of mass distribution of the system in three-dimensional space as a function of time. Well, so uh, I would just give a very simplified view of the localization process for micro and macro objects. You see there, I have a microscopic object which is in a superposition of the two Gaussian here and there. The other Gaussian that I have drawn is my localization function, and therefore, if a localization occurs at that point, bloody hell, why? oh, it will, if it occurs there, well, multiplying that Gaussian times the Gaussian which is there, you get zero, so you localize the particle, then you normalize the state, and you get the particle which is localized in that region. Obviously, localization out of the region in which the wave function is appreciably different from zero, has probability zero of occurrence because the probability is related to the norm after you have applied the localization. But this is an important point, the trigger uh, the, sorry, the trigger mechanism, this is a fundamental point. That is to say, in the case of a macroscopic rigid body, you can immediately see that if you have a particle there and it suffers a localization, when this pointer is here, the wave function of that particle is different from zero only in that region, and so the product of this Gaussian times the wave function of the particle which is there makes zero, which means that localizing one of the particles of the pointer localizes the whole pointer in this case. Well, I have made an almost rigid body, but you can consider also distribution of of particle. Well, I remember that Philip Peer was working many years on these problems, and the two problems that he had to face were, were the trigger mechanism and the, the preferred basic problem and the trigger mechanism. And when John Bell wrote to me asking to guest uh, Philip Peer for one year in Trieste, he came and he has uh, given a, an interesting improvement that I will describe briefly of this, of this theory. Well, the problem is choosing the constant of the theory. Well, the original choice has been that lambda is 10 to the minus 16 second minus 1 for a nucleon because it has been shown and it has been stressed repeatedly also in this conference that the reduction must be proportional to the mass. So that is the reduction frequency for a nucleon. The localization accuracy is 10 to the minus 5 centimeters, so my parameter alpha is 10 to 10 centimeters. Well, then you remark that a microscopic system suffers a localization about every 10 to the 7 year. But due to the trigger mechanism, if you have an Avogadro number of particle, one gram of matter, if it would end up in a superposition of being here and there, the superposition is suppressed in 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So this is the game, essentially. Well, Bell at ICTP in 1989, this is the last peak of Bell, as written this number, I don't share this, <laughs> the only I consider this as a phenomenological model, which is interesting to consider, but he has said these numbers are new constant of nature, like the fine structure constant. That's, in my opinion, a very good solution for this problem in the context of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And if I were teaching non-relativistic quantum mechanics, that is the line that I would take. Instead of all that talk reduction, this is micro, this is macro, I would have this new equation and you would see that big objects have definite configuration and you would see that little objects like hydrogen atoms are fully represented by the Schrodinger wave function. Okay, a mathematically more elegant, this is what has been worked out by Philip Peer, essentially, and subsequently by Peer, Rimini, and myself, is to use a Stratonovich stochastic differential equation. The WI is a set of real linear processes which average zero and covariance that I have written there. And essentially, this equation physically uh, is very strictly related. Actually, I have proved that if you take the statistical operator in the trace class, it can remain. You can have a heating process which is as near as you want to a solution of this equation for all times. Okay, so some remark. 
The physics is determined essentially by the product of alpha lambda. One over square root of lambda is the uh, localization accuracy, lambda is the localization frequency, with the only proviso that the localization accuracy must be much larger than atomic dimension, otherwise the localization inside the macroscopic body like a solid would produce dislocation or something like that, which can be proven already to, be, to violate experimental situation. Well, changing the above product by some order, and I will discuss this in a moment of magnitude, contradicts known facts or requires some modification like the introduction of an appropriate cutoff. Well, the model quantifies itself as a rival of quantum mechanics and so suggests where to look for the breaking, breaking of the superposition principle. Well, the basic question is, can the theory be subjected to crucial tests against quantum mechanics? Well, originally I was invited here to, <laughs> to discuss the experimental possibility of testing the theory, but then I, I have been informed that Angelo Bassi will speak after me and is working precisely on this, so I will make something quite strange and relate my further discussion to perceptual processes. So in the literature, there are various suggested tests which seems to become more and more feasible. The talk by Bassi will be specific concerning this point. So let me go on. For the above reasons, I have decided to concentrate my attention to what such models might teach us concerning the perceptual process. And I will even dare to discuss a possible perceptual test of collapse models against standard quantum mechanics. This is a little bit too ambitious, but I think it is interesting to know that something like that can happen. Uh, well, so I will start by recalling a debate which took place just when we have formulated our things. Uh, and uh, it has been, uh, there is a criticism due to uh, David Albert and Lev Weidman, in which they have made essentially, well, this is the, their, their proposal. You have an impinging atom which goes through a stern Gerlach magnet. It goes into the superposition of being along path A and path B. When he hits the screen, he excites about 10 photons, and then these photons have a very short lifetime, so they decay, and so you have the superposition of 10 photons from A and 10 photons from B. And Essentially, if to go on with this discussion, I need that you can test that you can create the linear the superposition of 10 photons from A plus 10 photons from B. Okay, the argument goes as follows. The atom ends up in a superposition of eating in A or B. Due to the decay process, one has a superposition of 10 photons emerging from A plus 10 emerging from B. The GRW theory cannot lead to a reduction of the state which triggers the perceptual apparatus of a conscious observer. The extreme sensitivity of our visual apparatus leads to a definite perception, because I have been taught by Professor Borsellino, who was a physicist in neurophysics, essentially, that six photon, five, six photon are sufficient to have a clear perception. So what are the precise modalities of a perception? I remember, I, here I am quoting a conclusion of David Albert in his book, Quantum Mechanics and Experience. Suppose we want to stick with the GRW theory anyway, what would that entail? Well, we would have to deny that measurement described above is over even once a recording exists. We would have to insist, and certainly this is an ineluctable fact when you come right down to it, that no measurement is absolutely over, no measurement absolutely requires an outcome until there is a sensitive observer who is actually aware of that outcome, so it's an attempt to push us in the direction of reduction by consciousness. But this is obviously not correct, because if you put a Geiger counter or you put a macroscopic apparatus, since you have a displacement of a macroscopic and a superposition of two different positions of the pointer, you have reduction in any case without any conscious ob observer. However, the argument represents a very subtle challenge, and so it has stimulated me to take this challenge. And I worked with Icardi, Borsellino, and Grassi, in 1991, and our argument is the following. 
the perceptual process implied transmission of the stimulus from the retina to the lateral geniculate body. Then you have the transmission from this to the higher visual cortex. The transmission mechanism implies the passage of sodium and potassium ions from the axon to the external region through the Ranvier nodes. I have drawn here. And the action is coated by the myelin sheet, which is just 10 to minus 5 centimeters thick. Even if one takes a very prudent attitude, this is our conclusion about the involved particle, it turns out that the process involved just within 10 to minus 2 seconds, which is the order of perceptual time, the displacement of so many particles, according whether the signal is a spot at A or a spot at B, that reduction takes place. So you have definite perception due to the universal mechanism which governs all natural processes. Well, is this analysis satisfactory? Recently, Professor Adler who was investigating this, has discussed the problem. So here I have put the GRW choice, 10 to minus 16 seconds, minus one for lambda, which means that in the macroscopic world, you don't have superposition. But over this, you can have superposition. And there, you have the microscopic world which, in which you have atom and all these things. Well, the problem that Professor Radler has raised is, is it possible to assume that the reduction takes place in the rod of the eye? To do this, he had to change the factor lambda, the frequency lambda of a factor 10 to the 8. OK, now let me go on. So uh, well, first of all, I would like to stress one thing. Our model, uh, if you uh, consider the characteristic time in which the Hamiltonian changes appreciably the state vector of the system, uh, this is extremely larger than the time separation between two reductions. While in the perception, because the perceptual process is just completed in 10 to minus 2 seconds, there is a competition between these two processes fundamentally. Well, uh, well, no problem. You have 10 to the 25 reduction during the time in which the wave function, for instance, the spread doubles or something like that for a macroscopic body. So uh, on the other end, both according to GRW as well in other model, the localization are just reducing the superposition in a time interval comparable to the perceptual times. So in view of this previous analysis, it is of some interest to study explicitly a case in which you have the Hamiltonian evolution and the reducing dynamic which are competing. Competing in the sense that there is not a difference of 10 to the 22 <laughs> concerning the characteristic time of these two processes. OK, so the proposal. I dare to put forward a proposal. Well, I come from Trieste, which is the, <laughs> the city of Kanitsa. We were always making a test. <laughs> so uh, in a proposal of an experimental test involving perception. So I consider a toy model. This is an absolutely trivial and simple calculation. I want to understand what happens when the two processes become competing. No more than that. So I take an Hamiltonian, which is essentially sigma x. This is the statistical operator, but I stress that we have individual reduction and not ensemble reduction in a GRW scheme. And I take a wave function, which is A and IB. And I have taken A and B real. I have taken A equals 0, point, uh, 0.48 and point, point 0.52B. I have not taken them equal for one reason, because in that case, I would have a stationary state of the system and no evolution. Well, these are the projection operator of the angle state of Z. And this is the evolution of the statistical operator, which is an evolution of the quantum dynamical semigroup type. This is the Hamiltonian evolution. And this is the part which corresponds to the reduction process, essentially, so to the projection. So we have solved this equation. Well, the characteristic time due to the Hamiltonian evolution is pi over 2 omega. The characteristic time interval between two reductions is 1 over lambda. And since I would like to have a reduction in 10 to the minus 2 seconds, lambda must be of the order of 10 
to the two second, 10 to the minus two second, I want the reduction. Well, so the next step is to choose the ratio between omega and lambda. And I have taken two positions. First of all, one which corresponds to GRW, I've taken epsilon equal 10 to the minus six, which means there are one million reduction during one rotation of the spin, essentially, and the other alternative is epsilon equal 10 to the minus two, which is much less. Well, then we have, uh, oh, there is one thing that I must stress, that in our model, in GRW theory, you have reduction in a very short time, a reduction with the appropriate quantum probability, and then you remain in that state for millions and millions of years, very various time the age of the universe. But for t tending to infinity, the vector does not tend to a definite state. On the contrary, since I have this model, which is a two-dimensional model, I have that since the quantum dynamical semigroup equation has one of the identity as a solution, any solution for large time must tend to this value, which means that it cannot reproduce the quantum probabilities, because even if you start with a statistical operator corresponding to two different probabilities, you go to 50% and 50%. But this fact is not relevant, provided there is a region in which you you already had reduction and you have a certain result because at that time you can fix it, freeze it by saying, for instance, to the guy, make a cross according whether you have seen the spot signal from A or from B. And so at that point there is a macroscopic change and nothing changes anymore. Well, so let us analyze the cases. This is the case 10 to the minus 6 seconds and lambda 100 seconds and you see that uh, in uh, an interval of some hundred of a second, I have a reduction. This is the real part and the imaginary part of the off-diagonal element of the statistical operator. And that is the, uh, the, the row one, that is to say the first element, the dialogal element of the statistical operator. And you see that it starts from 48, because we have 48 percent, and it remains to 48 up to 10 to the 9 second, just because we have this frequency. If you go on with the frequency, the region in which then you, go, you, you change becomes more, more uh, large. Well. Here, you have something similar because you see that, for instance, at 400 of a second, you already had a reduction of the imaginary and the real part, so you have diagonalized, you have reduced the state, and there you have something, and you see that the only thing which changes radically in this case is that the equilibrium position is reached after 1,000 seconds. But what is important is to compare the two. Uh, so let me see. This is the case that I have described before. Epsilon is 10 to the minus 6. In this case, the reduction leads immediately, this is 1,000 of a second, to a reduced statistical operator which corresponds precisely to the quantum probability 48% of the upstate. So the reduction the uh, process is okay. Only about after 10 to the 9th second, the asymptotic regime is established. Here instead, you have this behavior of R1. In this case, as already stressed, the asymptotic regime is reached much before for an order of 100 seconds. However, there is a region in which there is a plateau, and what is interesting is that you draw a line where you have the plateau instead of 0.48, you have something more than 0.49. <laughs> so uh, the general indication of this analysis is that triggering the, apparatus, the perceptual apparatus with state corresponding to definite perception randomly distributed 48 and 52, supposing that when you have a clear signal, you have the corresponding perception then you would get 48 and 52. But if you trigger the system with the state, A spot at A plus B spot at B, you tend to have an excess of uh, detection of the spot at A. Obviously, uh, I was discussing this with Bennett, and Bennett told me, oh, but then you can make faster than light signaling. So what happens if you change the state? And the idea is very simple. Suppose here I take an untangled state, in which chi1 chi and chi2 are two states on Bob's side, 
then if Bob decided to measure chi 1 or chi 2, he has a reduction either to A up plus B down or to A up minus B down. While if he chooses to measure chi 1 plus or minus chi 2, the, the operator which has this as eigenstate, is reducing either to up or to down, which are those which give a definite perception. Therefore, his idea was if both the state with the plus and the minus give the same result, you could put out a mechanism for making faster than light signaling. And this is not possible because we know that GRW does not allow faster than light signaling, and the effect of triggering the perceptual apparatus of Alice which A minus B instead of A plus B must compensate, and we have checked also this, and this is the final figure, and you see that essentially when you trigger with A plus B, you have 49, but when you trigger with A minus B, you have 47, essentially, and the compensation gives exactly the result, 48, which is what you must get. Well, so this is more or less the story, and I will conclude. We consider interesting to check collapse model against the standard theory, and the talk by Angelo will be illuminating in this sense, because it's not so fantasious as mine. <laughs> Uh, from this check, one should not exclude or referring to perception, and we have made plausible that if one would be able, and I don't have clear ideas about this, I have discussed this point many times with Francesco De Martini, he said that it's very easy to make a state which is a superposition of 10 photons from A plus 10 photons from B, but actually I don't know if experimentally this is feasible. However, if you make this, then some perceptual effect would differ according whether one resort to the statistical measures or one trigger with definite spot from A or spot from B or from the superposition of the two might emerge and this would be another way of putting into evidence that even at the perceptual level this theory is different from quantum mechanic. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. If I do understand this model to go a non-linear term in the Schrodinger equation. Absolutely. I, yes. If so, I think there would be, let's say, two problems. Namely that uh, if you consider a general type of non-linear term, there will be very stringent bounds on the size of this term. So, Sorry, there will be. Steve Weinberg have analyzed these theories from a general point of view. And ah, for out, the nonlinearity. Yes, and point out that these terms have to be very, very small. Secondly, a subclass of these models lead to, well, the so called Polshinsky telephone on which branches of the wave function talk with each other. So, uh, I presume none of your proposals uh, clash with that, right? Yes. Well, for what concerns the first, oh, sorry, for what concerns the first part of your question, the answer is very simple. I have studied the Weinberg paper and I have studied Gizan paper in which he has proved that Weinberg paper would imply faster than light signaling. And actually I wrote a paper with Renata Grass in which we have enforced this and Weinberg has written to me that he, he had liked a lot our. So if you make only non-linear modification, you can have faster than light. Then Renata Grassi and myself have proved the second thing, that is to say that if you save linearity by introducing only stochasticity, like Stapp was proposing at a certain time, you can have reduction at the ensemble level, but not at the individual level. But if you put both, this is nonlinear and stochastic, then you can per you have no faster than light signaling. It has been proven, I think, that the first thing that Bell has done when he has presented our paper at the Schrodinger Centenary Conference, it has an appendix in which he shows, essentially, that our model does not exhibit parameter dependence. And so it cannot lead to faster than light signaling. Prego. <laughs>